If you've seen any of my videos, you know how much respect I have for a realistic rendition of the beautiful game, so much that I've trained myself to play using the broadcast camera angle over the past 5 years. But for this video, I thought I'd go way back to the very first football games that I've played on any system. And as a 37 year old who's been playing football games almost his entire life, my story goes way back. <laughs> For being the most popular sport in the world, there was an anemic selection of football games available for the Game Boy. My first football game was Nintendo's World Cup. I saved for a few months of academic rewards that I earned at school to buy it, and was immediately disappointed. The game seemed to care more about the graphics, and was too arcadey and immediately felt like it was made by someone who was not a fan of the sport, and felt the need to spice it up with way too many special moves. This was very unlike Mario Tennis, where your angle and distance from the ball influenced its trajectory leading to a more rewarding experience. Thankfully, Goal came out for the Game Boy with similarly rewarding gameplay, where you can actually shoot anywhere because you can move anywhere. I also loved the clever zoomed out views that showed you where the action was happening on the pitch to better plan your attacks. It was clear that the developer understood that a varied gameplay with more possibilities leads to higher replayability. Now I might have started this video with Game Boy games, but actually, just like my story ends with a Konami game, it also begins with one. Meet Konami Soccer, which came out in 1985, and was my most played game on my Sony MSX before my uncle bought me the Game Boy. Now this game obviously sucked. Players were mixed between 4 hair colors, 4 outfits, and 2 skin colors. Speaking of outfits, if you're tired of waiting all year for teams to restock their exorbitantly expensive jerseys, Check out Lou Soccer's website for some of the best replica jerseys for a fraction of the cost, and celebrate Liverpool's Champions of England, Europe, and the World trophies by ordering all three badges when making your order. You'll also get a sweet discount by using the code MD5 when you check out. Use the link in the description below. Now back to Konami Soccer. You didn't even aim your shots, instead, you timed them according to a cursor moving behind the goal, which when I think about it now, was actually a unique and creative way to aim your shots. But when I was away from home, there was another game that sucked in all my quarters. Super Sidekicks, my most played arcade game. It's both exciting and infuriating. It had very realistic stripe graphics, especially compared to everything else that existed on any platform back then. I love it so much that I've actually owned the even better Super Sidekicks 2 on my Neo Geo MVS for the past 3 years. Do let me know in the comments if you'd like to see a retro realism review of this game on this channel one day. For an early 1990s game, small touches like the breathing animations were just awesome. It was notoriously hard to score when you reached the later stages of a tournament. To this date, it is the only football game that I've played on an arcade machine. When I wasn't playing Super Sidekicks at the arcade at night, I was playing Sensible Soccer. In a way, this game was the polar opposite. You had an unparalleled sense of freedom when it came to passing or shooting the ball. As a matter of fact, the ball was too free. If you made a turn with the ball while dribbling, it would just continue along its path. Now because there was no radar, you had to guess where your players were and where the goal was, making the goals even more rewarding. Sensible Soccer was a huge success, so much that it made a modern comeback in late 27 for the Xbox 360, with the same classic free ball minding its own business. Back to the 90s, by 1992, I had finally owned a decent PC, and other than using it to draw football stadiums on paint, the first game I got for it came on a single 5 inch floppy disk. It cost me around 50 cents, and it was the official Euro 92 game. There are three things I remember about this game. The massive goals that tempt you to shoot before you discover it was actually hard to score, a common theme at the time, the red card which for some reason looked black, and the lovely header goals. Seriously. I feel that this game was designed so that you can only score using a header. One year later, and while poking around in Norton Commander, which is a DOS overlay that was all the rage before Windows 3.1 came out, I found a game called Striker. Apparently, Dad's friend thought it would be a nice surprise to install it without letting me know. It was incredible. Easily my favorite pre-98 old school football game. It had a ton of teams, and the differences in player attributes were extremely palpable. The animations were awesome, and so was the dot matrix scoreboard. 
Most importantly, the bomb mechanics were extremely satisfying, particularly the swerve. The ability to control the ball mid-air after shooting made way for satisfying build-up play and some lovely finishes. From there on, the games just started having better graphics, but not necessarily better gameplay. Empire Soccer was the quasi-official World Cup 94 football game. It actually looked good, but was too arcadey with the ability to perform several special moves to spice things up. It was enjoyable, but nowhere as rewarding to play as Striker was. My first encounter with FIFA happened around 1995, with FIFA International Soccer. I don't have many memories with FIFA International Soccer, other than how I liked the slanted top view, and how you can run away from the referee when he was coming for you. It was a very favorable departure from any other game that I've played in terms of realism. But nothing would prepare me for the arrival of the first modern football game, FIFA 97. This was the first truly 3D football game I've played, in a view similar to that used for real matches on TV. I was blown away by the fact that there was not one but two commentators like on TV, and that they would occasionally disagree over calls. Sure, the net didn't move, and the player faces weren't all that, but this was a milestone in soccer gaming history. The reason you won't hear much talk about FIFA 97 is because of the masterpiece EA produced the following year. Even though FIFA 98 is best known as the last good game EA ever made, I remember the first day I returned back home with my copy of FIFA 98. I was actually underwhelmed on day one. After seeing the generational graphical leap that was FIFA 97, maybe I expected a similar leap to happen on an annual basis. However, it quickly became apparent that FIFA 98 was actually a generational leap in gameplay, which before then wasn't exactly a huge focus for football game developers. There was a sense of randomness in gameplay, and a feeling that anything can happen. The fact you can aim in all four corners, the bigger role of tricks, as well as huge graphical leaps like some net animations, stadium intros, face customization, and menus that look better than anything Konami produced to date, made it clear that FIFA 98 was exactly the improvement that FIFA 97 needed in every possible way. Now you'd think that the underwhelming World Cup 98 game would ease in the shock of how horrible FIFA 99 was. But having witnessed the revolution that was FIFA 97, then the even bigger upgrade that was FIFA 98, I must say I was shocked by how bad this follow-up was. Not only was the visual improvement barely noticeable, but the game actually played a lot worse, and it marked the beginning of the on-rails feeling that would define the series and ultimately push its fans away to that other Japanese game. From this point on, every new FIFA game would come with one big gameplay feature that would be heavily marketed, only to be dumped and replaced with a new feature. For instance, FIFA 2000 had a pass reliability rating, which was a small colored arrow on the pass direction that changes color depending on how well defended the recipient is. Needless to say, the ball traveled between players like a pinball, without even a power bar, while being bound to players with a magnet. This continued in FIFA 2021 where the best thing about it were the circular stadium turfs. The one gameplay feature they added this year was a shooting power gauge, and that was pretty much it. The following year in FIFA 2002, they expanded on this concept with a passing gauge and a more liberated passing. This was actually one of my favorite titles because of how you were able to finally pass into a space, which reminds me now of the beauty of manual passing now that I made the switch in PES 2020. FIFA 2003 tweaked sprinting a little, and that was pretty much it. This was around the same time I and a bunch of FIFA fans who have been exposed to Winning Eleven started jumping ship. Now I did dabble with Winning Eleven on PlayStation back in the early 2000s, and the first thing a FIFA player notices is that no two goals look the same. The sensation of freedom in play construction and goal scoring was something unique to the Japanese counterpart, and by PES 4, I had officially made the move to Konami's camp. To say it was a breath of fresh air was an understatement. Even though I wouldn't make the game-changing switch to manual passing before another 15 years, there was an unrivaled sensation of randomness mixed with purpose that made every goal you score feel unique and earned. Because of how they perfected gameplay, the annual updates in the PES series were all minor, but huge once you get to know the game. For example, PES 4 had a faster pace that favored a more aggressive style of play, while PES 5 had a slower, more deliberate pace I enjoyed a lot more. 
Pest 6 seemed to bring the best of both, bringing back a more exciting faster paced game with better build up play. These small incremental updates in gameplay culminated with the brilliant Winning Eleven 9 Korean Liveware Edition, a legend entry among the PES community. This is the kind of game that was too perfectly balanced, it's hard to point out exactly what they did right with it. It just felt right, wasn't the least bit frustrating, and even if you lost, the matches were just rewarding to play in. For reference, while PES and Winning Eleven were gaining more and more ground as the clearly superior football game, FIFA was introducing its same old headline features like First Touch that seemed mostly geared towards marketing the game than actually improving the gameplay. EA finally started making real changes when FIFA 08 debuted on the PS3 with a brand new engine, marking a new beginning in the game. By FIFA 11, this new engine had matured enough to offer a comparable experience to Winning Eleven, with way more polish and licenses. I made a brief move to FIFA when it was all my roommates would play at the time, and I actually loved it and felt it was a truly next-gen experience compared to what Konami had to offer at the time. But by 2014, I had moved back to PES with its brand new Fox engine, and the rest is history, especially with FIFA transitioning into becoming more of a football-themed cards game, completely relinquishing gameplay superiority to PES. If you liked this retrospective, leave me a like, subscribe to this channel, and let me know which other retro football games have you played that were not covered in this video before moving on to the last two remaining titles in the business, as we move over to a new generation over the next two years. If you haven't heard already, Konami is saving its next-gen Unreal-based game to PES 2022. But that's not a bad thing, especially if you're a PC gamer. You can find out why in my last video examining all the mods we'll still be able to use for this year's game. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.